So welcome to number N plus one of my <laughs> podcast interview thing. I'm here with uh, Lofty, who is working on some chip Hi. design thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, like, who are you basically and what are you doing? So I'm Lofty and probably a handful of Twitter people will recognize me because I mostly dabble in Yosis development and in particular like logic synthesis. That's kind of my specialty. Mm -hmm. Uh, which means, like, when it comes to maintaining uh, time-driven synthesis flows in Yosas, it normally comes down to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so you thought, like, hmm, all these timing flows are kind of weird. I'm going to design my own FPGA or... Uh... Uh, that was a kind of interesting one. Um, so a good while back... Whitequark, who most of you should know of, but if not, uh, she's another Yosis developer alongside me. Uh, she posted a reference to an FPGA made by Pilkington, and Pilkington are slash were a glass company. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Pilking the Pilkington process is for making sheet glass. But they also, in the mid, in the 80s to 90s, dabbled in field programmable gate arrays. There were subsidiaries called Pilkington Microelectronics and PMO. And what was like some sort of automation a, thing for them, or they just randomly did FPGAs next to their class or something? Uh, it was basically a separate company owned by Pilkington, but... Oh, I see. Obviously, there's not much in common between FPGAs and class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what made the Pelkington FPGA interesting to me is that, so for normal FPGAs, you have lookup tables, right? Mm -hmm. You have like... Uh, N inputs, two to the N bits of SRAM, and then a MUX tree that selects an output based on that. In the 80s and 90s, things were significantly weirder than they are now. Mm -hmm. um, you would have a CPLDs, which were based on some products form, which is basically an OR of AND terms. And Due to De Morgan's law, you can basically also build the all out of inverted and, so you basically get something with giant and gates. Yeah, and these like, are basically yeah. structured as like interconnected uh, multiple large inputs, like uh, the ATF fifteen hundred series that White Quark has is based on like a five input hand gate plus like a door and some other interesting stuff and flops okay so is it the same well, where they are like uh with like you know flip flops and routing or they're just like sort of fixed structures uh they're fixed structures like They'd have sort of buses going across like pins, etc., for intermediate terms. Mm -hmm. So you can structure stuff out of by basically picking off terms from the bus and then creating more terms to throw onto the bus until you finally got something which was what you wanted. Right. Um so in 80s, 90s, I'd have to look it up, but anyway, Zynx comes along with what we'd recognize as a fairly traditional lookup table. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's basically a fracturable lookup table because it's essentially two look threes 
which also have a max to produce of four, um, lot four, if I'm wrong. So you can either use them as two lot threes or lot four. Mm -hmm. um, also, since this was, is slash was patented, I don't know how that works exactly, but yeah. Uh, other competitors were exploring other ideas. Uh, Actel had something which was based on multiplexers, where um, I'll, I'll go into the theory of how that works in a probably in a while, but like the idea is, is basically you're producing terms by multiple by multiplexing terms together, okay. uh, and this is formally like a binary decision diagram. That's like the theory behind it. Uh, and Pilkington were using a sea of gates approach where you'd have like fixed function, small, like ASIC style gates. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have like masses of local routing to interconnect these. Um, yeah, so it's more like, a, like an FPGA in terms of the routing, but then it's, it's more like a sum of products kind of thing for like the actual cells or something like this. It kind of, whereas the sum of products form is like lots of, as I said, five inputs. We're mm -hmm. talking like two inputs for, well, the original ones they had were basically like two input NAND or a latch. And they're going through finer grained approach, which allows you to sort of shape the tree as necessary. And what really caught me is, is a patent that I stumbled across, which was discussing how the, well, I wrote a blog article for it, calling it the Pilkington TS1. But I was reading through the patent a bit more, and they mention a device which is like 12,500 gates. Okay. And that lines up more with the part which was TS2. So it might actually be TS2, but anyway. What they have there is that they've got like a still fairly small logic cell made up of AND or NAND. Uh, exclusive or and a multiplexer, and that's it. Okay, and I guess the, um, the, the XOR is because XOR is kind of bulky to make out of other cells, or yeah, XOR is clunky to make out of, and because like you'd need three ands, I think it is because mm -hmm. it's effectively yeah. an or of A and not B and B and not A, yeah. Whereas the exclusive or gives you like reduces delay and reduces effective area because like you're using the saw instead of the app. Mm -hmm. uh, so the TS2 is interesting to me because like when you think about a modern FPGA, you have to go through things like lookup table mapping. And if you try anything too fancy with your LUT structures, the modern tooling to any hand like well. But like and exclusive or multiplexes, these are like the fundamental primitives of ABC. So, so it's like easier to write software for or yeah, they basically the map knows how to work with them intuitively. Mm-hmm. Which means that with modern tooling, you can get something which is actually really efficient. Okay. Like, I've been experimenting with the Skywalter 130 nanometer process. Mm -hmm. And with the ti experimental timings that I've got with that and the like standard cell flow, it was working out to some mappings, like on a 130 nanometer flow, you could get something which was roughly equivalent to like ICE 40 performance. Oh, okay. Like ICE 40 HX. 
At age 40 Despite is what kind of massive node? Massive process disadvantage. Yeah, well, what, what kind of node is uh, ice 40 on? Well, it's called ice 40 because it's 40 nanometers. Yeah, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, a fair bit bigger and you get sort of similar performance. Yeah, you have to sort of strongly nudge the type of the census algorithms to get what you want. So how, how did you when, like test this? Did you sort of write a dummy flow with your with your uh, cells that you're designing, or how did you get these numbers uh, from your system? Basically, using like fairly simple Verilog, like fairly simple Verilog Geosis synthesis, and then I was using Open STA in order to get timing through these, and then you take the timings from that and you plug it into a almost but not quite uh, a sick flow mm -hmm. because to the tooling even though it is technically an fpga it looks to the tooling like an asec yeah you're not doing load mapping you're just doing like basically you're doing like direct cells cell and then and from there let's let me just pull up like the data I've got. So I've got like a Pico RV32 core at like eight nanoseconds uh, inputs to output. So we're talking 125 megahertz Pico RV32 on a 130 nanometer process. <laughs> I see. And for the timing data, you're basically using the timing data from the standard cells of uh, the Sky 130 process. Uh, well, sort of. Uh, it's built out of the timing data for the stand cells, but I, um, built, I built my own Verilog. So it's like I've got an input selector, I've got like the function selectors in there, and then I've got like the output selection. Mm -hmm. And so it's more than just the timing of like raw ASIC cells, we're including like input selectors, etc. Yeah. So, like, it's not a fully fair number because we're lacking interconnect delay there. Yeah. Although, because of how the interconnect delay works in a chip like this, where essentially you've got like uh, a node fanning out to like two to two cells in either direction, so like most full most not all but most of the cases you're effectively using the the timings routing delay is roughly fixed mm -hmm. so you can like take the take or leave the timings depending on that but like because it's logic timing and like since we're also comparing with like logic timing for my cells versus logic timing for ice 40, I'd say it's at least a fair comparison because, mm -hmm. as I said, ice 40 is about eight and a half seconds, if I remember correctly. Okay, so it's a little bit faster than ice 40. So, a bit, so course, from, what I, from what I understand, you're designing your sort of logic tile from scratch, like. Like completely analog, right? You're not using, or are you sort of designing going on a digital level? So I'm working on a from a digital point of view, and then taking this and converting the digital point of view into transistors, mm -hmm. and then from there I'm using some automated tooling called Lever Cell to turn the transistor netlist into something which is usable by the tooling which gives me like actual timing data through a cell okay that's the hope anyway <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, the layout is it done by some place in root or you're planning to manually lay out your transistors the layout is being done by like the legal cell layout lc layout ah, okay but like LC layout is definitely an early program, shall we say? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I've not heard of um, it, so. Uh. <laughs> uh, understandable. Is like, it from, is it like from the eighties, or it's like super new and uh, fancy and uh, modern? And, uh... Uh, it's super new. Uh, fancy is questionable. <laughs> um. Uh, can, if you want, I can actually send you a link so you can have a look. Yeah, or uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I don't know if it's interesting to share your screen to show how your flow works a bit. Or uh, I mean, I guess I can do that. Give me just a sec. Right. Uh, right. Okay. So. Post disabled participant screen sharing. You want to fix that. I can't share my screen because you disabled it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Interesting. Oh, uh, as, as, uh, who can share? All participants. Yeah. Okay, now you should be able to share. All right. Let's hit. Share screen. Right. So this program is Libercell, mm -hmm. uh, as you can see in the top, codeberg.org slash talk, T-O-K, uh, slash Libercell. And this is, it's an interesting program, but one of the problems it has is that it's in Python. And Try. Uh, I'm not sure I'd recommend trying to solve NP hard problems in Python. <laughs> anyway, oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, WSO is slightly screwed at the moment, which isn't too great. Right. So I guess I'll have to sort of improvise. Right. Okay. So, so this is your whole logic cell, I guess. Well, this is not the whole thing it's part of it and it's kind of limited due to like physical process limitations so if i wanted to make this bigger i probably could although the tooling would really struggle <laughs> <laughs> so what, what what kind of limitations are you running into here uh so the default places in LC layout are there are three places. One is based on Z3, which is an SMT solver. Mm -hmm. So basically, it turns the problem into an SMT problem and asks it to optimize as much as possible. Right. And this is not very fast. But you can get a solution uh, with maybe, like, I can usually get a solution within like 15 minutes or so. Okay. For my 44 ish transistor design. Um, the other two places are built on the concept of Eulerian paths. Uh, like an Eulerian path is basically a trip through the nodes and such that you're covering, you're traveling through all nodes at least once. Okay. Then you can like restart at another point and then keep going. That's like the idea of an Eulerian path. And from the paths, it can sort of work out which transistors should be placed close to each other because the paths will always go through them. Mm, I see. That's the idea anyway. I recall on Twitter, you were talking about something like a limitation of the number of transistors in series. Uh, Could you repeat that? Where, what, what's that about? <laughs> Could you repeat what you asked? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, but on Twitter, you said something about the limitation of the number of resistors you could have in series or something like this. Oh, yeah. Uh, because of how like the fabrication for this works, you can't have more than like four transistors in series without like a buffer. 
And one could argue that performance might actually be improved if I added more buffering, but the guideline I was told is like four transistors in series. And as you can see, this really brushes up against it. <laughs> Example, yeah, well, one, you, 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 two, three, you don't have four. enough uh, gate voltage then anymore, or, four, or what happens if you put more than four? Uh, you... So one conceptual model of looking at this is essentially you're talking about a resistor capacitor network. Mm -hmm. And the transistors are both resistors and capacitors. Right. When you want to charge something up, you have like going through the path of each transistor is effectively a resistance. And then when, once it is charged, it then has a capacitance. Roughly, this is my understanding. Do not take this at face. It's, well, the, you know what I mean. Um, so the way that works is that you want to minimize like series resistance and capacitance for maximum performance. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like a but speed thing. A point, basically. Like there's a delay of the delay and of charging and discharging it makes it so performance and in general it starts to get a little tricky to physically realize because you get a technically they're like for the most part they are like nmos can transmit like can pull stuff to ground and it is mostly, it's fairly efficient at doing that, but it's not perfect. And after a while, you sort of get something w in which the voltage levels wobble, and that can lead to metastability where like some of the gates might or might not trigger because it's not exactly at the thresholds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the idea is effectively that I've got like always four transistors, at most four transistors in one series. Yeah. Otherwise, it just becomes like too slow, basically. I guess then. Yeah. Or it doesn't work at all. <laughs> and but but this so this circuit you're only using it for your own reference, right? You can't you you don't use KiCad for simulating it or anything. No, I don't. I I have tried to use the keycard simulation tools. It doesn't really work for me. Yeah, I, I made a pull request on keycard to improve it a little bit, but it's still sitting there. <laughs> yeah, so I, I agree. It's not uh, great. That was like, kind of like, was curious also why, how, how you were using keycard is basically. Um, um, so, so basically, do you just export this to like a netlist and then programmatically do something with it? Or how do you? feed this uh, to your program not well i would show you but it's currently in the middle of w cell being dead because of reasons anyway oh, okay i'll i guess i'll have to sketch it out in the most glorious of sketching programs which is of course <laughs> paint All right so the idea is I have a Rust program, which I dubbed TransCreate, which I'm going to just scroll the name of here. TransCreate. As in transistor creation. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my input to it is essentially a rough description of the logic like the way I've got, it's a Rust program and uh, I'm just using a crate which passes in a logic, which passes a logic expression and turns that into a binary decision diagram. Okay. So effectively I have like, so for example, you'd have a, I can't draw an and sign. So you're just getting like combined together. So here's your AND term, mm -hmm. and you've also got like an OR term, which, which is, let's go back and let's, 
So we have an and which is a b and we have our zor which is a, not a and b or a and not b and then it goes into like a mux which is like i've got it named as you saw so like I'm going to slightly spoiler it and use BDD notation. <laughs> so this is like the one path and this is the zero path. So if okay. you saw is one, then we're using, the, well, then we output the saw. And if you saw is zero, then you can imagine how this would be described as like, you saw a, not you saw a, B, or you saw not a, B, or a, you get the idea. Yeah. And, this, and, and you just so it takes in an expression like this. Mm -hmm. And then it turns. Sorry, go on. Yes, you basically give it. So you're you worried about sort of like a transistor level synthesis engine, sort of basically, or not? So, kind of. So the idea, the theoretical idea is we take this and then we turn it into a binary decision diagram. And those of you who know like how circuits work and possibly even those who work with this probably notice that this layout looks quite odd <laughs> because uh, this is based this is derived from a binary decision diagram not from like the standard complementary cmos well complementary series parallel network if we're being precise but So the idea is that if we take in this simple example, we already have like one node here, which is uh, user. I don't know what the actual best ordering of it is, so forgive me, but like, so user is zero, then we want a, so if a is zero, then like we want zero. And if b is zero, we're also going to zero. But if a is one, then we're going to what? And then if b is one, we have to put one. So that's like the, and that is basically an AND gate represented as a binary decision diagram here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you're following along with why. Yeah, yeah, this sort of makes sense. And then on the other hand, you have like a. And Do like the solid lines indicate one and the uh, dash line zero, or? Yes. I see. That's the idea of this anyway. It, I, th I find it better to use solid and dashed lines and like some people will put inverters here and it's really difficult to tell from like a lot random line whether it's a true or false line. So I use dot, uh, mm -hmm. solid and dashed. <laughs> I admire your dedication to draw dashed lines in paint. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and then we have like, it, we need two child B nodes. Mm -hmm. um, so if A is false, then we want B to be true in order to return one because the terms are different. And if B is false, then we return zero. 
hopefully the diagrams are looking already, but hopefully you can get that. And if A is one, then you want basically the opposite because we want B to be zero for to get a one. And if B is one, then I'm going to sort of take a liberty here, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. The diagram's a mess, and if I wasn't doing paint, I'd make it look pretty. So from here, you can actually construct a transistor network. So the way you look about look at this is there are a few ways of looking at it, really. But one way is to consider that this is effectively a. Uh, let's actually use something brush right. This is, let's draw ourselves a bow tie. Right. Wow. This is a transmission gate and it's control fed in by not use saw. And then you have this, which is the true, uh, true path. And this is a transmission gate. And this is fed by Usor's trope. And then you can go on and do this for like the subcircuits. I see. You sort of get the idea for how that expands. And then a, you can then take a picture of a transmission gate and then expand that into your transistors, which is. Please forgive me for my terrible transistor drawing. I'm trying my best, but <laughs> right. It's a paint transistor. It's allowed to be. Uh... So we want an NMOS. Uh, this is going to be the faulty part. So we want. The NMOS is going to, we're going to drive an NMOS by, you saw. And the PMOS by, not you saw. Right. And then you can see how this is effectively a transmission gate. And from there, you might sort of be able to see how the structure of the circuit emerges. Oh. Like, these are effectively a transmission gate. But there's a small trick here, which is partly due to tooling, partly due to how physics works. But anyway, um, what I've done here is that I've actually sp I've split the planes of like if you can imagine like if I drew a wire between these two and a wire between these two a wire between these two mm -hmm. and then join the wire together and like you have a transmission gate there yeah. as you can see But by making the planes of PMOS and NMOS disjoint, A, the tooling handles it a bit better because the tooling really does not like this at all. <laughs> uh, and B, this reduces capacitance because like each path is, is basically charging like only one transistor instead of both transistors. So right. even though it's technically still following the same rule of four transistors in series because of how it works it's a bit it's faster and it roots a bit better because these can be put in their own paths mm -hmm. and then once you split out the planes you can then like you'll probably notice that we have here for example pmos driven by a cell and if this was a proper transmission gate, that would be matching NMOS driven by 
positive A cell. Yeah. But you can remove the NMOS there because, like, this is a PMOS and it's being driven by power. Ground. Oh, yeah. So, oh, you see. <laughs> power here. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's a power sign pointing downwards. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Illegal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As everyone knows, CMOS circuitry draws their powers from the depth of hell. <laughs> I see. I see. <laughs> anyway, so I could redraw this to like fully separate out the planes, but this kind of still shows the transmission gate circuitry, mm -hmm. which I find aesthetically pleasing. But the thing you're actually using is is coming out of your your Transcreate program. Yeah. What Transcreate provides is I can't open it up, but it's like a crappyish text file of like uh, you have like a couple of it's spice esque for want of a better word. Like you have for example BMOS. And then you put in what the gate the gate network name is. So, for example, you'd have here it would be is or n by convention anyway. Mm -hmm. And then you have like the source, which is going to be well, gate drain source. So, like source is going to be. Q and then so on. You get the idea. Yeah. And then you'd have a matching N loss, which is so you can turn something like this into a cell file using this spice esque format. Mm -hmm. And this is also what, like this. This is what you feed to your place and wrote program. Yes, this is what LC layout. Well. More specifically, I'm using basically a program which wraps LC layout and mm -hmm. it will this simplified cell format and converts into the actual spice formats that LC layout's looking for. I see. But it's a bit easier to write it's like the simplified cell format by hand. So yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you, and how do you go about like verifying your design? Do you like do spice simulations or Generate fairy lock and verify that um, way, or both, or everything, or nothing. So let's pull up the actual repo for this. Um, so if you're going to like the tools, this is a Perl script because, of course, it's a Perl script. <laughs> uh, and it, there's a Perl script which essentially takes in the simplified cell format. And from there, it basically builds a truth table. And that's how you end up with the useful information. It's actually quite nice because it's like orchestrates the entire Libra cell flow. Okay. And that's more push notifications anyway. Um, you can actually see like an example. Let's take the NAND two because that's pretty simple. And I'm going to blow it up so that anyone following can actually see it on screen. Like you have your input declarations of just A and P and an output declaration of Y. And then you just have PMOS, gate, gate drain source, etc. Mm -hmm. And then a Perl script, another Perl script, Converts the uh, spike. I was kind of expecting uh, tickle to be honest. Sorry, I was kind of expecting tickle to be honest. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how whether pearl or tickle is better, but <laughs> not a question I want to ask if I'm entirely honest. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, there's just like dumps dot sub circuits, and yeah. 
Okay, this and this you just feed into NG Spice or something like this. Uh, the full flow, which I believe is, I think it's this one. Uh, it'll call LC layout to hopefully TM get a GDS output, etc., and magic format. And then from there, it'll then call LC time in order to patch the, in order to get mm -hmm. like characterize it. And that will be the bit that call NG spice. Okay. And then it will do things like run checks and fixes using magic. And then it will hopefully eventually fill, produce like a Liberty format. And it also show like the final or is it an SVG? Oh, okay. I think it's a quite nice piece of tooling and that's yeah. why I use it. See, this looks quite automated. Like you just feed it some things and you just get your results out basically. Basically, like the idea here is you go into the catalog file, you can type make layout and then sell equals. And then like I have this described as a dot cell file. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it will just call the tooling as necessary. Okay. <laughs> but at the moment, like even this cell is some way off being easily producible. Because, well, the Eulerian path tool basically exhaustively enumerates all of them and does this by calculating all possible graphs and nodes here and then calculating all the paths for all of the graphs. And this results in something like there being several billion possible paths to enumerate here. Oops. And it's all being done in terms of Python. Oops. <laughs> so I've been sort of sketching out a simulated annealing based placer. Okay. So from then on, like the goal is more or less to get something like this that can be placed. And I've sort of chunked out how the cells go together. So if we go into like, what we've got here is essentially like the core logic cell. This is missing a bunch of fairly important things. Um, so, so basically the plan is you, you first make like a an, an, uh, GDS for this core cell. And then sort of after that, yeah. you want to sort of I guess make a digital flow FPGA out of it or so I'm going to like you call it core because I don't have anything best to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this will have a, a bunch of config bits which are whatever and output. And that sort of has this, which is almost but not quite a third. So this is A, this is B, and this is Muxel. Because surprisingly, it is the selector to the Nox factor. And you have like Zor. I'll just recreate it. Zor. Nox. Zor Nox. That's actually it. We can't do that there. Okay. So then A and A and B are basically similar and differ basically on input routing. So we have a MUX4, another MUX4, And these are actually from the standard cell library because it multiplexes like this are one of the weaknesses of BDD format. Hmm. 
because like the way it works is you end up with like a selector and then chaining the multiplexers results in a massive explosion of nodes. It's not very nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess this, this, this MUX4 is already super optimized, so why not use it? Yeah. Don't reinvent the wheel where it's unnecessary. And then we have sort of a special lofty cell, which is essentially Ooh. a MUX2 Zor, I'll call it. The idea is, is that we have like these two MUX fours, and these are fed by basically the same config bits, etc. And then we have so, so these do, these, these MUX four, I guess, are like go to neighbor tiles, or yeah, uh, I can explain the routing in a bit if you really want to know, but yeah, no, just 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 the gist of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess you have like X here and then, uh, right, let's see how good my own is. Um, let's draw, let's actually go back and draw some X, box, box. X box. Box, box, box. Box, box, box. And then the way this works is sort of you have, if my memory serves me correctly, like we're talking from the output point of view here. So this goes into like A, uh, and then you have another one which goes into B. Another one which goes here into A, and this one goes into B, and then we have a similar sort of pattern on the top where this goes to A, this goes to B, this this goes to B, and this goes to A. That's sort of how it's laid out. I might experiment with this in the future, but that's how it's currently laid out. And the idea is, is that this, so you normally have like feedback paths, uh, for example, well, flops and latches have their own magic, which I'll deal with later. And well, you'll see, I'm sure. Let's head back to this. So the idea here is that we want, uh, this is basically the input selector block, uh, block mm -hmm. which I'm just gonna call I cell. And from there we want to select from one of the eight possible, well, I say eight, it's eight, seven-ish. Because like you're talking, you want a zero here, really. And the idea with the Zor gate here is that we can provide optional input inversion. Okay. So for example, if you want an AND, you can do the same as inverting both inputs and you get an AND. And if you want X nor you get you can invert them, etc. So that's okay. sort of how that's laid out. Right. So basically, the MUX4 selects from from the, so from most namers or ground, and then you can invert it or not, and then you feed it in your and core cell. And like the inversion is how you get like a one constant if you need it. Right. And so from there, you have like. The way it's structured is maybe a bit unhelpful to describe, right? Because like this is a BDD, but um, the way the core logic is structured. Uh, so you have like input selector, you have like, I'm going to just use your logo.
A, and then and then these go into more or less a common bus, like you've got your and you've got a Zor. And then you've also got a mux. And then these are, you have another mux on this side. And this is useful. Uh, this is fed from Luxel. Then we have another Mux. And this is fed from these Mux. Right. And then you get your output. And that's basically how the logic cell works. This differs from the TS2 in a couple of ways. For example, they had some funky circuitry where like this had its own inverter and you could also use the USAW to optionally invert the selector. But in my honest opinion, I don't think that's necessary. Mm -hmm. So it got scratched. <laughs> Nice. Uh, and yeah, that's basically how the F feature is laid out. Cool. Well, kind of. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting, is... It's an interesting overview of what you've been up to, basically. And uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we've like covered a lot and been going for a while. Yeah. Uh, so I think maybe this is a good point to make an end to it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the interview and uh, see you later. I'm very happy to hear it. <laughs> Take care. And...